So in this video, we're going to briefly see about the pathophysiology of jaundice. So we'll be seeing about the basic classification of jaundice, the pathophysiology, and what the difference between the three types of jaundice. So we know that jaundice is when the bilirubin level in the body crosses the normal limit. So what is the normal concentration of bilirubin in the plasma? It is around 0.2 to 0.8 gram milligram per deciliter. So whenever the bilirubin concentration is more than 2 milligram per deciliter, we call it as jaundice. So we can detect it clinically only when the bilirubin exceeds 2 milligram per deciliter. So basically, jaundice is because there is excess bilirubin. So why is there an excess of bilirubin? So it can, can be either because there is an increased production of bilirubin or because there is a decreased excretion of bilirubin. So one condition in which you can have an increased production of bilirubin is when there is increased destruction of RBC. We know that when there is RBC destruction, bilirubin is produced. So if there are more RBCs that are breaking down, you will have more bilirubin formation. So that is one cause of increased bilirubin. Another cause could be a decreased excretion of bilirubin. Now that could be because the liver may not be able to conjugate the bilirubin efficiently. Or it can be because there is a biliary obstruction, so excretion of bile is not occurring properly. So there are two reasons why bile is not excreted properly, either due to ineffective conjugation by the liver or when there is a biliary obstruction. So based on these basic causes of increase of bilirubin, you can divide jaundice into prehepatic jaundice, hepatic jaundice and post-hepatic jaundice. So this is a broad classification of jaundice based on the pathophysiology. So now we will see each one by one. First, pre-hepatic jaundice. So as I said before, it is due to an increased production of bilirubin. And one common example where you have an increased production of bilirubin is increased destruction of RBCs. Now, as I said, the increased destruction of RBC will produce increased bilirubin production. We have also already seen that in the fate of hemoglobin. So this type of jaundice in which you have an increased destruction of RBC is also called hemolytic jaundice. So now we will just see what are the different factors that occur or the pathophysiology in hemolytic jaundice. So because of increased destruction of RBC, more bilirubin is produced. So more bilirubin is going to be transported via blood and they reach the liver. So naturally more bilirubin is going to enter into the hepatocyte, more bilirubin will be conjugated and thereby excreted into the bile. So all that will reach the intestine and thus there will be increased production of urobilinogen, increased production of stercobilin and increased production of urobilin. Now remember in, there is one more thing here because the bilirubin is, is found bound to albumin in the blood, there will not be release of bilirubin in the urine. Right? There will be urobilin, but bilirubin per se will not be present inside the urine. So that is why this is also called a chlorouric jaundice. Okay? So in hemolytic jaundice, there is excessive production of bilirubin. So naturally, the liver must conjugate more than normal quantity of bilirubin, which means more quantity of conjugated bilirubin is delivered to the intestine. And there is increased excretion of fecal stercobilinogen and urinary urobilinogen. And because bilirubin in the plasma forms a complex with albumin, there is, it cannot be excreted in the urine and thus you have a chlorouric jaundice. Okay, so this is the pathophysiology of hemolytic jaundice in a nutshell. Next, we will see about hepatic jaundice. In hepatic jaundice, it is the conjugation of bilirubin that is affected. So naturally the, liver, the conjugation is not occurring properly. So naturally the excretion of bile is also not occurring properly. The excretion of bilirubin is impaired as the liver cannot conjugate the bilirubin efficiently. So this type of jaundice usually occurs in viral hepatitis. So here again we will see the pathophysiology. So in hepatic jaundice as I said before the conjugation of bilirubin is affected. So naturally there will be increased amount of bilirubin albumin present inside the blood but the liver is not able to conjugate it properly. So because the conjugation is affected, its excretion in the bile is also affected, which means there will be decreased urobilinogen, decreased stercobilin and decreased urobilin. Now one more thing is that because the conjugation is affected, this bilirubin 
in turn will escape from the liver cells back into the blood stream which means bilirubin can be excreted in the kidney in this case because of this back flow of bilirubin from the liver cells to the blood so here in this case the urine will be yellow in color or more yellow in color because of the presence of bilirubin so let's see the pathophysiology once again in hepatic jaundice we have conjugation of bilirubin is impaired so naturally the blood contains excess of bilirubin albumin complex the excretion of conjugated bilirubin in of in bile is impaired so naturally there will be accumulation in the liver cells this diffuses across the cell membrane into the blood stream and is thus excreted in the urine which produces a yellow colored urine also the fecal stercobilinogen and urinary urobilinogen is reduced okay so this is the pathophysiology of hepatic jaundice now we'll see about post hepatic jaundice so in post hepatic jaundice the conjugation of bilirubin is occurring but it cannot be excreted in bile due to biliary obstruction so a good example of this is in gallstone wherein there is a stone in the common bile duct or whenever in conditions there is a stricture of bile duct so this is also called obstructive jaundice so post hepatic jaundice is otherwise called obstructive jaundice so we will see what happens in obstructive jaundice so here in this case it is the excretion of bile that is impaired so naturally the amount of bile that reaches the intestine is impaired which means there will be less urobilinogen less stercobilin and there will be as i said before the the bile will accumulate in the liver cells so naturally it will be it will diffuse into the blood stream and thereby it produces a uh, passage of bilirubin in the urine okay so here also you can have yellow colored urine so let's see when there's obstruction to bile flow there is no bile in the intestine so there will be no fecal stercobilinogen formed and not only bilirubin there will be reduced bile salts in the intestine so what happens is you need bile salts for digestion of fat so because bile salts is not there you can have steatorrhea that is increased fecal fat excretion so thus you can have a clay colored stool there is no fecal stercobilinogen there is increased fecal fat so naturally you will have a clay colored stool in case of obstructive jaundice and you can have absence of urinary urobilinogen and as i said before here also the conjugated bilirubin accumulates near the obstruction so there will be regurgitation into the blood stream and thus you have high conjugated bilirubin in the blood and that is excreted in the urine and thus you have a deep yellow colored urine present now not only that because bile salts also enter the blood stream you can have pruritus so that is one symptom of the patient in case of obstructive jaundice because the bile salts also enter the blood stream because of the obstruction and thus you can have pruritus so you can see that obstructive jaundice is a more severe version of impaired biliary excretion okay so this is the pathophysiology of obstructive jaundice so, so now we will see the differences between the three types of jaundice so bilirubinemia that is the amount of bilirubin in the blood so in hemolytic jaundice it is mild in hepatic jaundice it is moderate but in obstructive jaundice it is severe what about fecal stercobilinogen we said in hemolytic it is increased because amount of uh, stercobil amount of bile in the intestine is more so here it is increased here it is decreased and here it is absent what about uro urinary urobilinogen again it is increased in hemolytic decreased in hepatic and absent in obstructive jaundice what about urinary bilirubin it is absent in hemolytic but present both in hepatic and obstructive jaundice and what about liver functions it is normal in hemolytic impaired in hepatic and it may be impaired in obstructive so these are the differences between hemolytic hepatic and obstructive jaundice so now i i hope you know the physiological basis of why each of these happen okay now one thing that we have to know more is regarding vandenberg test so let's see what vandenberg test is so vandenberg test is basically done to find which type of bilirubin is present in the sample whether it is conjugated or unconjugated so we've got two types or no three types of vandenberg test one is called the direct vandenberg test so in this what we happen is we take the sample so suppose this is a serum 
which contains conjugated bilirubin. To that we add a reagent called diazo reagent. So when this diazo reagent is added, if there is conjugated bilirubin present in the sample, it will have a change in color. Okay. So when the diazo reagent is added to a serum containing conjugated bilirubin, the coloration is obtained within 30 seconds. So thus, when you have a color difference with direct Vandenberg reaction, it means there is conjugated bilirubin in the sample. So next is indirect Vandenberg reaction. So suppose we've got a sample with unconjugated bilirubin. So initially when we add this diazo reagent, no color is obtained. But then when we add another solvent more like menthol which dissolves this unconjugated bilirubin, then we get the coloration. So that is called indirect Vandenberg reaction. So once you do a direct test and if you don't get a color, you can add menthol and say. If you add menthol and then if you get the color, it means there is unconjugated bilirubin in that sample. So that is indirect Vandenberg test. Now one more scenario is called a biphasic Vandenberg reaction, which means it contains both direct and indirect component. So in this what happens is, to the serum when we add the diazo reagent first, you get a partial color change. But then when you add menthol, you will get a stronger color change. So that is called a biphasic Vandenberg reaction. It means there is both conjugated as well as unconjugated bilirubin in the sample. So thus in a nutshell, in a Vandenberg test when you get a direct reaction it means you have conjugated bilirubin. When you get an indirect reaction it means you have unconjugated bilirubin. And when you have a biphasic reaction it means both types of bilirubin is present. So coming back to our table, what are the different Vandenberg tests that you will get in the three type of jaundice? So in case of hemolytic, you will get an indirect one because you have unconjugated bilirubin in the blood. In the hepatic, you will get a biphasic one because you will have both conjugated and unconjugated. And for obstructive, you will have a direct one. Okay. So thus, in this video, we have seen the classification of jaundice, the brief pathophysiology and what are the differences between the three types of jaundice. So I hope this video is useful for you. Thank you.